Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We finished studying Chapter 4 of Book of Acts in our last lesson. This closed out the first recorded account of persecution the infant church experienced, and this was followed by a second overview of the life of the early church. As we turn our attention to Chapter 5, we will see the first discipline that the church experienced and the results that came from it. This account is serious, and we should pay close attention to what happens so that we understand what displeases the Lord. There's a powerful and disturbing principle that would be good for us to think about as we study the first 11 verses of chapter 5. The principle is this, when God is near to his people for revival, he is also near for judgment. How the Lord responds to people when there is no revival is different than when there is revival. His standard of holiness never changes. It's just a matter of how he responds when he is near in presence and power. Let's begin with verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. The beginning of chapter 5 is a continuation from chapter 4. Chapter 4 ends with Barnabas selling a piece of property to financially help the needs of poor believers, and Ananias and Sapphira did the same thing. There was something very different between the gifts offered by Barnabas and that of the husband and wife, and it's similar with the account of Abel, whose offering was accepted by God, and Cain's that was rejected. Who Ananias and Sapphira were, we don't know beyond what's recorded in these 11 verses. Translations are divided on whether this was a possession or property. One translation called it a farm, and a couple used a state. The Greek word used with Barnabas refers to land, and this is a different Greek word than what Luke used in relation to Ananias and Sapphira. All confusion of the matter is settled in verse 3, where Peter clearly states that they sold a piece of land. Verse 2 presents the motive behind what Ananias and Sapphira did. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but bought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. The problem isn't that Ananias and Sapphira kept back some of the money from the sale of the land, but that they lied about how much they sold it for. Why did they do this? Probably because they wanted to look spiritual and may have even been vying for some position or status in the early church. What we see is this in a Phariseeism creeping into the infant church, and it didn't take long for this to happen. Jesus highlighted the spirit behind such Phariseeism in Matthew chapter 23, verse 5, where everything they do is done for men to see. Matthew chapter 23 is the account where Jesus strongly rebuked the Pharisees and religious elite for their hypocrisy and dead religion. In verses 25 and 26, Jesus pronounced against them, saying, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. They outwardly made themselves look righteous and pious, but their inward life was totally corrupt, and this is what was going on with Ananias and Sapphira, at least to a certain degree. To what extent, we don't know, so we can't say whether they went to heaven or hell. In verses 3 and 4, Peter confronted the lie and hypocrisy, declaring, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. Peter was given a word of knowledge, which is one of the nine spiritual gifts Paul wrote about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is where the Holy Spirit reveals something about a person or situation that could never be naturally known. There could also be an operation here, the gift of discerning of spirits, which is similar to a word of knowledge, but reveals the spiritual condition of a person or situation. This is why Peter could say that Satan had filled the heart of Ananias with evil, which is what happened to both husband and wife. How this happened we don't know. But somewhere along their spiritual journey, a demon began whispering in their ears, and since the temptation was appealing, 
they eventually gave over to it. James described this process in chapter 1 of his epistle in writing in verses 13 through 16. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. We are always tempted at our weak points. Though demons are thoroughly evil, they aren't stupid. They're not going to waste their time tempting us with sins that we aren't attracted to. There appears to be five principal sins that are involved in this account. The first was spiritual pride or self-righteousness, which is seen in their desire to look more spiritual than they actually were. Husband and wife wanted to appear as spiritual equals to people like Barnabas, or possibly even with the apostles. The second sin appears to be greed because they secretly kept back some of the money from the sale of the property. Peter pointed that out when the money was theirs, they could have done with it what they wanted to. They could have said that they were only giving a portion of the money from the sale of their property, and that would have been acceptable. This is another proof against the belief that the early church lived in communes, which would have been a primitive form of communism where the commune owns everything and the people nothing. The third sin was their love of pleasure and this is seen through their desire to keep back the money to use for their own selfish purposes. This could have been a desire to protect themselves from financial destitution if the persecution grew, or possibly to have some extra money to depend upon in the future. They may have wanted to live above the poverty level many believers were finding themselves in because of being rejected by family and friends. The fourth sin is the belief that compelled them to trust in wealth rather than to trust in God to take care of their material needs. The final one I will mention, which is obvious, and this is lying to cover up for all the other sins. Peter said that Ananias was lying to the Holy Spirit and not merely to people. Since God is a lawgiver, breaking his laws is an offense against him and his kingdom. King David acknowledged this fact in Psalms 51. That's a confession of the sins he committed through adultery with Bathsheba and then the murder of her husband. He wrote in verse 4, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. This isn't a denial of how his sin hurt others, but a confession that sin is always, first and foremost, against God. There may have been other reasons why Ananias kept back some of the money from the sale of his property, but these are the main ones. This couple probably justified their actions by claiming they were reasonable, yet they knew that they were doing wrong because they lied to deceive people. These two verses also reveal how the theology of the infant church was developing. Peter first stated that Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit, and then he declared that he lied to God. This proves that the primitive church believed that the Holy Spirit was God. It also shows how they believed in the Trinity, though the theological implications of this hadn't been fully worked out yet. It would actually take many decades for the doctrine of the Trinity to be clearly defined, and it was the rise of heresies that forced the church to do this. The response of Ananias to Peter's word of knowledge is scary. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died and great fear seized all who heard what happened. The man didn't die from natural causes as if he had a heart attack from the shock. But this was a divine act of discipline that was meant to teach the infant church a powerful lesson about the holiness of God. Tozer made a great point when he wrote, Left to ourselves, we tend immediately to reduce God to manageable terms. This is what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. They forgot who God was, or maybe they never really knew. In their minds, they made God to be like man and robbed him of his holiness and majesty. In Psalms 10, the author asked a question that plagues many people. Why, O Lord, do you stand afar off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? When speaking the thoughts of the wicked, he wrote in verse 11, he says to himself, God has forgotten. He covers his face and never sees. This is a deception that can come to all people, where they either downplay the serious nature of sin or think that the Lord isn't concerned about it at all. 
The death of Ananias helped the church to change their view of God that may have been slowly declining as they went on with the mundane things of life. Solomon stated a fact about our sinful nature in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11, writing, When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. If we aren't immediately judged for our sin, then we are prone to think that God doesn't care, didn't see it, or that we will no longer have to give an account for it. These are lies that demons love to get people to believe. Probably some demon was whispering into the ears of Ananias and Sapphira to get them to diminish the serious nature of sin and that lying to God wasn't a big sin. The Lord clearly said otherwise in an unmistakable way. The Lord declared in Psalms 50 verse 21, These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. Here's an example of people creating a God in their own image instead of living as people that were created in God's image. It's easy to think that God is like us, that he thinks like us, and therefore he acts like us. This is a powerful deception, and as we see in the account of this married couple, it can have very grave consequences. The immediate response of the people to this act of divine judgment was that great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Now, that's a wise response to what had taken place, and that's the lesson the Lord wanted to teach both saints and sinners. We can get so caught up with the love of God that we disregard His holiness, which is a very dangerous thing to do as Ananias and Sapphira have proved to us. Not because everyone who does so will immediately be slain by God, but because it will surely open the door to sin that will eventually kill us, both spiritually and eternally. We are told in verses 6 and 7 what comes next. Then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. There doesn't seem to be any demonstrative mourning over the man, formal funeral preparations, or any service held by family or friends. We know that the wife didn't know that her husband was dead and buried. In verse 8 we read what Peter asked Sapphira, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. We learn from this that Sapphira was a co-conspirator with her husband. This was unique given that in the ancient Middle East, the culture was patriarchal, which means that the home was ruled by the husband and the nation by men. The husband most often transacted business for the family without his wife's consent and possibly without her knowledge. Women weren't normally allowed to perform business transactions on their own other than the typical purchases for the household. For Sapphira to be a partaker of her husband's deception means that she was either involved in the whole thing from the beginning or was commanded by her husband to collaborate with him, and she complied. Then in verses 9 and 10, Peter said to her, How could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment she fell down at his feet and died. The young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. To lie is to tempt the Holy Spirit because he is the spirit of truth, and all lies are an affront to him. The Lord slew Sapphira as an act of severe discipline, just like he did her husband three hours earlier. Such acts can be hard for us to understand, but it's good to remember that whatever the Lord does is redemptive in nature. It might not be redemptive for those who are on the receiving end of divine justice, but somehow the Lord uses that for those who will listen, repent, and obey. We don't know what the eternal consequences were of Ananias and Sapphira. There's not enough information to make a clear determination. At the very least, the Lord used this situation to reveal that He is holy, and this caused people to hold Jesus in reverential fear, and this was very good there's a slight possibility that the Lord was showing mercy to Ananias and Sapphira by removing them from the earth before they sinned in such a way that would produce their damnation. The Lord doesn't want anyone to perish, and this is even true for people like Ananias and Sapphira. Verse 11 tells us what comes out of this disturbing account. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. 
This event may have stemmed the tide of lukewarmness that might have been creeping into the church, for it doesn't take long for this to happen. One good thing that came out of this was how those who came to Christ after learning about this event did so with reverence and the fear of God. No frivolous hand-raising and man-pleasing kind of conversions after knowing that the Lord might slay those who lie to the Holy Spirit. The final point I want to make about this event is its similarity to the slaying of Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu. We find the story in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, where Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. The tribe of Levi was given the privilege of ministering to the Lord through the care and upkeep of the tabernacle, and then later the temple. From the tribe of Levi came the family of Aaron, and they were given the privilege of being the priests, and from the priests came the high priest, Aaron being the first. Aaron's sons were serving in the temple by offering incense, and they didn't obey the Lord's command on how to perform that ritual in an acceptable manner. They used fire from a different source than from the altar, and that's why it was called strange fire. The Lord responded quickly to their irreverent act by consuming them with fire. This certainly caused Aaron and his other sons to think differently about their responsibilities in serving God as priests. The fear of God came into their life. This event is mentioned multiple times afterwards to remind the Levites and priesthood that God is holy. In the New Testament, the formal priesthood of Aaron was superseded by the priesthood of all believers that not only included all those believers outside of the tribe of Levi, but believing women and Gentiles as well. The priesthood of all believers did away with the formal priesthood, and all those religions and denominations that have a special class of priests are in direct opposition against New Testament teaching. To have a formal class of priests, churches must use the Old Testament model that was done away with in Christ, and through Christ the original plan was accomplished, which was that all believers were to be priests of God. In the case with Ananias and Sapphira, as priests of God, they were offering to him a lying sacrifice, and the Lord slew them for this irreverent act. What the Lord told Aaron through Moses sheds more light on the subject, and this comes out in the next verse in Leviticus chapter 10. Moses then said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me I will show myself holy. In the sight of all the people I will be honored. Aaron remained silent. Listen to this very closely. Among those who approach me I will show myself holy. In the sight of all the people I will be honored. Here we are told that when we approach the Lord, He will show Himself to be holy. Why is this important? Because priests influence the way people think. And that's why the Lord said through Moses, In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. If the priests didn't respect and honor God, then the people wouldn't either. So the Lord responded quickly because when the Lord is near for mercy, He is also near for judgment. This quick act of divine discipline powerfully affected the people who would then fear God. The King James Version translated this verse a little differently. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. Here the emphasis is laid on those who approach God. They must set him apart in their heart and mind as being holy, and in this way they approach him in reverence and fear. By approaching the Lord in this manner, he will be glorified among the people. What we see in these two translations of the same verse, and both of them are accurate, is that we must know God is holy when we approach him, and when we do, he will show himself holy to us. The result of this is that the people will glorify God and give him the honor he deserves. This was the real problem with Ananias and Sapphira. They didn't approach God as being infinitely holy. If this was allowed to continue, then that heart corruption would spread and infect the infant church. By and large, this heart corruption has infected the American church. There's no real understanding of the holiness of God, which means there's no fear of God to keep people from compromise that always leads to sin. If on a given Sunday fire came down to consume those who claimed to be Christian, 
but have no fear of God, a very large portion of the church would be in ashes. What about you, dear listener? Do you truly fear God? Do you know Him as holy, not merely theologically, but relationally and in reality? It's extremely important that you understand where you spiritually stand on this matter so that you can get things right if needed or keep things right if they already are. The next section of chapter 5 begins the second recorded account of persecution against the early church and the apostles. Verse 12 begins laying out what produced this persecution. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. As we will soon see, the apostles preaching and performing many miracles grabbed the attention of the religious elite, and this brought about their jealous anger. Since Luke has only given an overview of the early church, he's mainly chronicling the life of the apostles. He will write on some lay people, such as Stephen and Philip. But their stories are so important that Dr. Luke had to record these events. The two main points of verse 12 is that the apostles were performing miracles and that believers regularly met in Solomon's colonnade. We aren't told where the apostles were used by God to perform these miracles, but at least a portion of them must have taken place in the temple. Those that took place in the temple would surely draw the attention of the religious elite. Solomon's colonnade, or porch, according to Josephus, was on the east side of the outer court of the temple. At this time, there wasn't a complete severing between the Jewish and Christian faiths, so it's reasonable for the disciples to meet in this public setting. And since the colonnade was large, it could hold the people during times of public teaching and worship that the infant church needed as it was growing. Those early believers gathered there out of convenience, the desire to worship God, to learn about Messiah and what it means to be one of his followers, and also to evangelize people. The fact that large multitudes met daily for worship only made the opportunity to preach the gospel all the more imperative. The Lord confirmed the truth of what was being taught by performing miracles through the disciples, especially through the apostles since they were the leaders of the early church. In verses 13 and 14, we are told no one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. There's in these two verses what seems to be a contradiction, where no one joined them, but the Lord added to their number. Though the disciples and apostles were highly regarded by the people for the life they lived and how the Lord performed miracles through them, People didn't quickly align themselves with them for two primary reasons. The first was over the fear of God that came over the people from the Lord slaying Ananias and Sapphira. People weren't going to casually align themselves with the way if they weren't serious about following Jesus. The second reason is that they didn't fear God, but feared man and were afraid of what others would say if they followed Jesus, particularly how the religious elite might respond. It may have been common knowledge that the Sanhedrin, which was controlled by the Sadducees, was growing more hostile against the apostles and the way in general. Being that they were preaching and performing miracles in the temple courts had to anger the Sanhedrin all the more. Though most of the people were unwilling to follow Jesus as their promised Messiah, the church still grew and the Lord kept adding to their number those who wanted to be saved. The fame of the miracles produced the outcome we see in verse 15 where the people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. This is clearly a fulfillment of what Jesus promised in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 12. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Because so many healings and deliverances were taking place, the people began to look for Peter and the apostles on the streets that they traveled and brought their sick to be healed. The people's faith had risen to such a degree that they believed even Peter's shadow could heal their ailing loved ones. God responded to their simple faith by performing these miracles. The challenge with such power resting on mere mortals is the pride that can easily rise up within us. This happens when we forget that the power comes from God alone and not from us, and that when His power is released through people, it's His mercy being revealed, and not that the person is special. The verse doesn't directly say that the people were healed, but I don't think Dr. Luke would have included this verse if it wasn't the case, since there would have been no real value for it being recorded. 
We learn from verse 16 that the preaching and miracles were having far-reaching influences in places outside of the temple. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. News of the miracles were spreading, and there was a distinct possibility that people were bringing the sick and demon-possessed to Jerusalem to be healed. The verse itself only states that in the areas around Jerusalem that news about the miracles were spreading, and that they were bringing the sick and demon-possessed to where they could be healed. Where these miracles were taking place we aren't told, but the response of the religious elite in Jerusalem makes it appear that it was in the city where they were being healed. Where the miracles were taking place isn't the big thing. The point is that they were taking place, and the powers that be were growing very concerned over it. Their anxiety was really over their own selfish ambitions and that these miracles might somehow hinder their keeping the political and spiritual power that they tenaciously held to. The next verse sheds some more light on this, stating, Then the high priests and all the associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Like I said earlier, the Sadducees were the prevailing power of the Sanhedrin Council because that was the religious denomination the high priest and his family belonged to. They were the liberals of the day, the corrupt, power-grasping, greedy leaders that were interested in only staying in power at any cost. Sounds like Washington, D.C. and the liberals today. The Sadducees were filled with jealousy not only because the apostles were performing miracles, but because their influence was gaining strength and they didn't want them to have more power than them. They would destroy anyone who gave the least appearance of taking any power or popularity from them or lower them in the eyes of the Roman authorities. The Sadducees were the religious party in favor of the Roman occupation because through Rome they retained power over the people and they would have sided with anyone who could have done that for them. They were mercenary religious politicians that loved power and wealth more than anything and more than anyone. This produced what we read in verse 18. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. How many of the apostles were arrested we aren't told. What had they done to incur the wrath of the Sanhedrin? They hadn't broken any Roman law, nor had they broken the Mosaic law. Their crime was that they were preaching in the name of Jesus and performing miracles through his name, and the hordes of hell hated that because they hated Jesus. Satan and the demon hordes stirred up those liberal religious leaders who were servants of the devil and compelled them to persecute the apostles. This is similar to what Christians are facing all over the world and will face more in this country as persecution grows more blatant and acceptable. Are you ready for it? Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill, let healing walk.